Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. I'm not going to do my usual spiel that I say at the beginning of most episodes. I'm going to be talking a bit about something a bit more personal, and it relates to my puppy, Boris. Over the past month, I've noticed that his breathing has become a bit different. It's raspy, he's a bit out of breath more, and he tends to hack up his food a bit more while eating. So I took him to the vet, and I found that he has a uh, condition called laryngeal paralysis, which is the first stage of a neurological disease that's similar to ALS in humans. But thankfully, that's slow-moving, and it's not really a concern until well down the road. But what is a concern now is the paralysis, and this is caused when abductor muscles in the larynx are not working properly, and they're not expanding and opening for a deep breath. And so it's not a horrible condition initially, but it does mean that Generally, he would have one to three years left, um, or in some cases, in more extreme cases, dogs only have a few months. So I'm looking to raise some money for his surgery. Uh, it costs $5,000, which is not cheap and well beyond what I can afford. So I've organized a GoFundMe. You don't have to, to donate. If you can even just share it, I would appreciate it. I just would like to get a few extra years with my dog. A bit of cool news. My other podcast, Canadian History X, is up for a Canada Podcasting Award in the category of Society and Culture. So to vote, you need to be a podcaster. So if you are a podcaster and you enjoy my shows, I would truly appreciate it if you could give me a vote. The link to vote will be in my show notes. And thanks again. This episode is sponsored by Brock Crocker. The history of the Edmonton City Centre Airport is a deep one, going back to the early days of aviation. On December 9, 1926, the airport began its history as the first licensed airfield, or aerodrome as it was called then, in all of Canada. The airfield would be associated with several famous individuals, but none were as famous as Wap May. May would take part in several amazing exploits during his flying career. He would be involved in the first aerial manhunt after a man named John Larson had killed a police officer in Edmonton. He was also involved in flying two airplanes with skis from New York to Edmonton, which were used to service proposed oil developments in the sub-Arctic. He would also form the North Alberta Flying Club and take part in the Race Against Death, which involved getting a diphtheria vaccine to Fort Vermilion to save the community. In 1932, he was involved in the hunt for the Mad Trapper, which has become part of Canadian cultural history. Now, back to the airport itself. The Vancouver province wrote, quote, Marking the opening of the first municipal aerodrome in Canada, a civic welcome will be tendered when two flying machines arrive at Blatchford Field here from High River Station next week, end quote. Thanks to the airfield, it was expected that airmail would soon become a reality in the region, and Edmonton would be one of the first cities to serve in that respect. The Regina Leader Post wrote, quote, Air Force officers from High River Field will be in Edmonton early in the new year to carry out a series of experiments in connection with winter flying, and according to Air Force experts and postal authorities, there is little to hinder the establishment of an air mail service across Canada, end quote. Kenny Blatchford, the mayor of Edmonton until late 1926 when he retired to serve in the House of Commons, also played a role in establishing the airport. The interest in aviation would extend to his son, Howard Blatchford, who would have the first confirmed Canadian victory in the air in the Second World War. In 1929, the airport would turn on its aircraft beacon for the first time. The beacon revolved at a rate of six times per minute and could be seen 64 kilometers away. Thanks to the beacon, night flying would soon be allowed in Edmonton, allowing the airport to reach yet another milestone. On May 1, 1929, Parker Kramer and W.S. Gamble were on their way to flying from Alaska to New York when they needed to land at the airport. The Kingston Week Standard reports about the difficulty landing here, stating, quote, Officials of the Edmonton Aero Club have set out flares to mark the runways, but these were misunderstood by the aviators as indicating obstacles. Sheer luck, coupled with flying skill alone, saved the flyers from disaster, end quote. 
In 1931, Wiley Post would fly around the world making various stops along the way, one of which was in Edmonton at the city center airport. He would repeat his flight around the world in 1933 and once again landed at the Edmonton airport. In 1937, a weather station was established at the airport. The Edmonton Bulletin reported, quote, A modern weather station, fully equipped, will be in readiness in the upper floor of the Edmonton airport hangar by the end of the week. With arrival of a shipment of equipment from Toronto on Monday, the local station will have everything required for weather observation. The station will not be a forecast centre, the forecasting being done from stations at Winnipeg and Vancouver. End quote. The weather station would feature thermometers, wet and dry bulbs for humidity and dew point, a rain gauge, a barometer, and a wind gauge, as well as hydrogen filled pilot balloons for determining the velocity and direction of the wind at different levels. From 1939 to 1942, hangars were built at the airport, including three double hangars that would be used by the Royal Canadian Air Force. When the Second World War started, the Edmonton Airport became an important stopover point for the Northwest Staging Route. It would also host two Commonwealth Air Training Plan schools. The first school, Number 2 Air Observer School, was established on August 5, 1940. As soon as the school opened, planes began to arrive including seven Royal Canadian Air Force twin motor planes from Camp Borden, five Lockheed 10s, three Lockheed 12s, and one Avro Anson were also at the airport at this point. The Calgary Albertan reported, quote, Pilots of the nine planes which passed over Calgary Friday night and landed at Edmonton were presented to Lieutenant Governor J.C. Bowen of Alberta and Premier William Aperhart after they landed at the number two Air Observer School at the Edmonton Airport Friday evening. End quote. On November 11th of that same year, the number 16 Elementary Flying Training School was established. The second school closed on July 17, 1942, so that the number two Air Observer School could be expanded. After the war, Hangar 14 was used by the Reserve Squadron and then Pacific Airlines and as part of the distant early warning line before it became a car dealership in the late 1960s. It would eventually become known as the Hangar on Kingsway, and in 2000 it would be designated as a Provincial Historic Resource. We'll talk more about this hangar later. In 1950, the airport became a stopover point on the international route operated by Northwest Airlines between the United States and Asia. On May 26, 1955, an Avro York crashed into a system shed on the north end of a runway, killing both crew members on the plane. The crash destroyed several boxcars in the CNR Calder Railway Yards. The plane was loaded with seven tons of freight, and it was believed the cause of the crash was the short runways at the airport. Mayor Horlick would state that the crash was due to the runways being unable to handle heavy traffic, and longer runways were needed. Only a few months later, on September 17, 1955, a Pacific Western Airlines Bristol freighter crashed near to the airport, resulting in several injuries. At this point, the move was on to build a new airport outside the city. This would become the Edmonton International Airport, which opened in 1960. In 1969, the jet age arrived at the airport when Pacific Western introduced the Boeing 737-200 jetliners, offering non-stop flights around Western Canada and the Northwest Territories. It was initially decided that the city center airport would close in 1963 once the passenger terminal was completed at the Edmonton International Airport. In the end, though, it was decided to keep the airport open. This would be the case for several decades. In the 1992 Edmonton Municipal Election, a referendum was held on the airport, which resulted in 54% of the respondents stating that the city center airport should remain open to the traffic it could handle. The Edmonton Journal would state, quote, The airport debate so far has sometimes seemed difficult to follow. The issue appears to generate its share of confusion. At civic election forums, there has always been a healthy round of applause for any candidate who declares the goal of keeping the municipal open, end quote. One year later, in 1993, the Alberta Aviation Museum was established. Upon the opening of the museum, Mark Hopkins, curator of the museum, would state, quote, We've got the history here, and we're at this point where we need some money to get things off the ground. We're kind of running on bare bones. End quote. In 1995, another referendum was held, and this time, 77% stated that the bylaw to keep the airport open should be repealed on the basis of all scheduled traffic consolidating at the Edmonton International Airport. The process to the closure of the airport would begin by the new century. 
From 2005 to 2012, the airport would actually be converted into a speedway for the Edmonton Indy Champ Car Race. On July 8, 2009, City Council decided to begin the phased closure of the airport. John Chalmers with the Edmonton Journal stated, quote, How can City Council consider closing our city centre airport? It is the oldest licensed municipal airport in Canada, which has served Edmonton long and well. It gave the city its moniker, Gateway to the North. Our city centre airport should be nurtured with expanded services to keep it viable. End quote. The first runway to close would be runway 1634, which happened on August 3, 2010. The next runway would close on September 26, 2013. On October 12, 2013, 50 to 70 light aircraft from across Alberta performed a small fly-in as a way to say farewell to the airport. The Edmonton Journal reported, quote, No pilot liked Edmonton City Council's decision to close the city centre airport, but now that it's a done deal, pilots and businesses are looking for safe places from which to fly, end quote. Well, the fight over services at the city centre airport lifted off again today. This time, Northern Alberta doctors say a decision by the province will put the lives of patients at risk. Bobana Benelich explains. We don't think we know the time to make the difference between a permanent disability or death and a good outcome. The Save Our Medevac Service Society believes that relocating the ambulance planes to Edmonton International will lead to delays putting lives at risk. The group says the Alberta government promised that medevacs would not be moved until rural and northern communities were guaranteed the same timely access to life-saving equipment and specialists that they have today. It has a tremendous impact for our ability to save patients to suddenly tell us uh, our 38 minute transport time is going to be closer to two hours or two and a half hours for that matter. And uh, we know that we will be losing patients in the process. We already lose patients. To drive its point home, the group took out a full page ad in today's journal asking the province to suspend its decision. Health Minister Fred Horn isn't impressed. I'm very disappointed. Uh, the ad uh, suggests to Albertans that they should be afraid as a Minister of Health. I have absolutely no concerns about uh, patient uh, safety. Save Our Medevac says the province is overlooking safer and cheaper options like continuing to land at the Muni. It maintains that won't interfere with the city's plans for Nate or the LRT. The mayor says, not a chance. The ship has sailed. It's done. <laughs> when, well, when, when, you know, I, the, the, no, you know, we're going to start developing that land as soon as we finalize some things. It's a red herring that people are trying to put out that people are going to be in jeopardy. I think that's irresponsible. The doctors say their priority isn't development, it's saving lives. Time is life. It would seem that in Edmonton, time is money. Save Our Medevac will lobby for more support at meetings this week in northern Alberta communities. Sylvana Benelich, CBC News, Edmonton. On November 30th, 2013, the last airplane to leave the airfield would be a Cessna 172 owned by a local individual. A touch-and-go landing was planned with two CF-18 fighter jets as a ceremonial last takeoff, but this was prevented due to bad weather. As for that hangar, well, that's where you'll find the Alberta Aviation Museum, and it's a great place. You can learn all about Alberta's history when it comes to aviation, so be sure to check it out. One great story that comes from the city centre airport is that of the jumbo jet that now sits in a field at the Villeneuve Airport. It is a Boeing 737-200 that was operated by Pacific Western Airlines, and it's been resting in that field just south of the airport facilities since November 29, 2013, when it took its last flight from Edmonton. The plane sits there because of space constraints at the former city centre airport, and the decision was made to take it to Villeneuve, but it was a process to make it happen. The $1.6 million plane was running out of time to find a new home, and as late as November 27, 2013, it was believed it would be destroyed as the last runway at the city centre airport was closing, as I mentioned, on November 30th, 2013, at 4.49 p.m. The Alberta Aviation Museum had only found out in July that the property line under the redevelopment of the airport lands would not give them enough space for the 737. The plane also had to take flights to get to its new location, as moving it along the ground would cost $500,000, far more than the museum could afford. The plane had first gone into service from the city centre airport in 1979 with Pacific Western Airlines and then Canadian Airlines International 
and finally Air Canada, who donated the aircraft to the museum in 2005. Since 2005, thousands of people had toured it, and many children had explored its cockpit. Thankfully, Transport Canada gave approval to fly the plane to its new location on November 28th. Once approval was given, 15 volunteer technicians from Canadian Northern Airlines gave the jet a safety inspection to make sure it was ready to fly. On the day that it was set to leave, a crowd gathered at the city centre airport fences to watch the plane take off on its last flight. Air traffic controller Brian Carlson would say, quote, It's a nostalgic feeling for me because I've worked at the international airport since the days when that would have been an active duty plane, end quote. When it took off from the city centre airport, it was a very quick trip to land at Villeneuve. One of the pilots, Tim Seagull, would say of the flight, quote, It was straight up to the Costco, turn left, and there's Villeneuve, end quote. Zegel and his pilot, Mike Wilson, both volunteered to fly the plane to its new home. Wilson would say that it was the shortest flight of his career. He would say, quote, Things happened pretty quickly. Tim did the takeoff and flew it over, and I did the circuit, the low and over in the landing. My landing was a lot smoother than my last two, end quote. Today, the 737 sits in the field so that it can be used by security agencies for training. It is also used by local movie productions for filming. We both, uh, you know, one of many people that would, uh, you know, that jumped at the, the chance to, uh, you know, have an opportunity to fly this airplane, its last flight out of the city airport. And, uh, yeah, fortunately, uh, we were uh, picked to do it, so. You're Canadian North pilots? That's right, yeah. And you fly the 737 as well? Yeah. The very same airplane as this. Is that right? Yeah. The 200? 200. We fly the, the um, 737, 200, and the 300. Um. So it's one of your shorter flights, I imagine. Can you tell me about <laughs> De how it went? Definitely. <laughs> Probably the shortest flight, yeah. It, uh, things happened pretty uh, quickly. But, uh, yeah, Tim did the takeoff and, and uh, flew it over, and then I did, I did the, uh, the circuit, uh, the low and over, and the landing. Okay. And uh, how did it compare to uh, your usual flights? Well, the landing, my landing was a lot smoother than my last two. <laughs> <laughs> Mike oh. did a perfect landing here here in uh, Villeneuve. Uh, it, it, he just rolled it on. It was uh, it was Do you great. Any concerns about flying a plane that hasn't been in the air since 2005? None whatsoever. Mm. No. As soon as the maintenance engineers said it's airworthy, we knew it was airworthy. And it's a Boeing. It's a Boeing 737. Uh, it's a tough tough old plane. It's a, it's a great airplane. I hope you enjoyed that episode on my look at the city center airport and once again be sure to check out the Alberta Aviation Museum. It's a fantastic place. There's so much to learn there. It's really interesting so check it out. Information from Canadian Encyclopedia, Alberta Aviation Museum, Edmonton Sun, Edmonton Journal, Wikipedia, Vancouver Province, Regional Leader Post, Kingston Wake Standard, Calgary, Alberta and the Edmonton Bulletin. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. And you can donate to the podcast by going to canadaehx.com and clicking donate. And I also want to thank all of my wonderful patrons. And I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Sarah White, Tom McMillan, Mike Sullivan, Wendy Mills, Keelan Pringnitz, Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobbs, Robert Page, Richard T., Colin Johnson, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nixon Ree, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke S., JP Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.